Supply Chain Resilience Stress Test. To discuss it, I'm joined by Chris Timmermans. He is Senior Managing Director and Global Lead for Supply Chain Operations with Accenture and David Simke Levy. He is Professor of Engineering Systems at MIT. First of all, Chris Timmermans, welcome. Welcome, Robert. Nice to meet you. And David Simke Levy, welcome as well. Welcome. Nice to be here. I want to start by asking Chris, why a new supply chain resilience test at this point? What was the genesis and the need uh, for creating this? Yeah, there's an obvious link with uh, the, the COVID-19 disruptions, uh, Robert. Uh, so uh, what we saw is that three out of four supply chains had some serious breakdown during this, uh, this set of disruptions. Um, also, just to give you a feel, only 17% of them were able to make necessary shifts to the online channel where that was needed uh, when customers wanted that uh, at, at, a very high, at a very high pace. And so where we originally had efficiency being sort of the, the table stakes for our supply chains, the buzzword of the day, of course, is resiliency. Uh, but there is a, a very deep understanding that we need to make these supply chains resilient. Uh, it becomes actually very close to our heart when it's related to medical items, when it's related to strategic food items. Uh, and then, then supply chains become the lifeline of humanity and, and we as a society cannot support or cannot tolerate them breaking down. Um, and so we saw the need for testing and measuring this and it's not an easy thing to measure. Uh, let, let's be very clear about that. Um, but the absolute need for companies, societies and, and governments to be able to say, is a supply chain, especially in strategic items, resilient or not? Uh, it's almost like a stress test. Uh, you know, can, can we have a measure out there mm -hmm. that allows us to see whether they are resilient or not? And there is this need for that, uh, that transparency. Robert. Yeah, the phrase stress test comes from the financial and banking industry, correct? The same sort of concept. Correct. C correct. Yeah. And it was also triggered by a crisis uh, to a degree. Um, mm -hmm. David, uh, what about uh, how did this all originate at MIT? Tell me about how the concept grew up there and MIT's contribution to this initiative. Yeah. <clears throat> so we at MIT, uh, Bob, started working on supply chain resiliency after events like uh, the tsunami in Japan and the flood in Thailand in 2012. Uh, our initial uh, um, work was done in collaboration with a company like Ford, where we implemented a new way to measure resiliency in the supply chain and identify hidden risk. This has had an impact on <clears throat> a variety of companies, but during the tsunami, with the magnitude of the impact of the disruption, uh, we at MIT have uh, done additional development. And in particular, we introduce the need for stress test where we borrow the concept from the financial uh, crisis of 2008. After the financial crisis of 2008, um, the federal government in the US and government in uh, Europe established stress tests that banks need to take uh, their business through to identify the level of resiliency. And the point we uh, made in our writing and in our research is that there are national security industries. Think about uh, the wood industry, think about healthcare, think about PPEs, ventilators, and think about life science. Here, you need to establish stress tests to make sure that you identify hidden risk, and as a result, you can develop mitigation strategies that allow the supply chain to respond effectively to business disruption. I see. Well, I'm curious, though, as to what exactly this stress test consists of. I understand that part of it, the strength of it has to do with the ability to run multiple scenarios, but just what exactly is the exercise that you put a company through in order to determine its supply chain resilience? Can one of you speak to that? So th there are uh, three levels that uh, the partnership between Accenture and MIT is focusing on. The first one is uh, establishing a digital twin. The digital twin is about mapping the supply chain. That's a critical step. Without understanding your supply chain, you won't be able to identify where is risk hidden. 
Once we have uh, established uh, the, the supply chain mapping, the next step is to use concept like time to recover, like time to survive, in order to identify the level of resiliency in the supply chain. And this is done by uh, integrating predefined scenarios. And we have a variety of scenarios that uh, the Accenture and MIT team have uh, focused on. And then using the analytics together with the predefined scenarios and the supply chain mapping to quantify specifically where is risk hidden, what type of changes to the supply chain you need to make in order to increase the level of, of, of resiliency and how fast can a company respond to a disruption anywhere in the business. And yet I would think that in order for a company to subject itself to a test of this nature, it would have to have already had a very deep understanding of its global supply chain. It would have to have mapped out that supply chain to give you the data necessary to make these conclusions. Is it the fact that enough that companies do have that type of internal knowledge or must they go through that routine before they can even subject to this one? So if I can take a first cut, mm -hmm. uh, you're absolutely right. You need to start with a good understanding of your supply chain. We have done a couple of uh, surveys to identify uh, how many companies have a good understanding of their supply chain that allows you to build the digital twin. The number are about 70% of the companies that we have uh, interviewed uh, allow us to use data to uh, map out the supply chain. The second level uh, challenge is when you ask companies, what about your supplier network? Much smaller number of companies have a good understanding of their supplier network. Mm -hmm. That's why part of this initiative is not only using the digital twin to identify the level of resiliency, but it's also when you don't understand your supplier network, identify what should be defined in the contract that will ensure that the supplier has the ability to respond to a disruption. Mm -hmm. Contract is all about price. It's all about quality. It's all about response time. But given the current level of challenges that companies have in their supply chain, it will also include the level of um, resiliency of the supplier supply chain through time to recover. And we have in fact seen companies starting to uh, require suppliers to report about time to recover. Mm -hmm. Chris, uh, in your extensive engagements with Accenture over so many companies over the years, what were you able to draw on in terms of, uh, in terms of material and understanding and approach to this test that you could use in, in developing the stress test? Yeah, we, we, we talked, uh, Robert, about the link with, uh, with the finance stress test. And so some ideas we, we captured there. So, for example, the number of scenarios that you pass actually drives the score of your, uh, of your, of your stress test. Now, in supply chains themselves, uh, you're absolutely right that creating a digital twin, uh, creating uh, those scenarios is not an easy task. This is not something you just plug in and, and you, get to, you get the answer. Uh, what is required here is uh, sampling. It's, re it's maybe required to look at one particular supply chain because most companies have multiple supply chains. Uh, consider one area of the business uh, and there use uh, really the digital information that, that companies have. Um, they have a lot more than, than most people would think. Uh, a lot of the things are digitized. It's just not surfaced well enough to draw conclusions that, uh, that David was, uh, was referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is something where uh, our, our mutual teams do this together with uh, the client because it requires quite some interpretation of um, inventory, supplier, uh, shipment, and all those sorts of, uh, sorts of data points. I want to get I a bit... Add, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. To this. Think about this um, as uh, similar in nature to network design. If you remember 15, 20 years ago, not many companies have gone through network design. Now, most companies engage and invest in network design activities. 
the data that we need in a resiliency model, in the stress test that we are focusing on, is very much related to the data that companies uh, use in their network design project. So uh, this data for a lot of companies is available. It is true that this is more challenging as, as, as uh, Chris identified. Challenging to identify the scenarios, challenging to identify the network of your suppliers. But the starting point is very much similar to a network design engagement. Mm -hmm. I still want to get a better sense of exactly how these scenarios work. Do you kind of spin very specific scenarios or situations? Do you say, okay, let's pretend in this scenario that there is a uh, that there's a tsunami in Japan. Let's run run this and see what happens. Let's pretend that a volcano erupted in Iceland. Let's pretend that there's a global pandemic. Is that as specific? Do you get that specific? I mean, how do the scenarios run exactly? So if I if you would like me to start we get extremely specific. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge of course with getting extremely specific is you need to be able to generate enough scenarios that represent what may happen. For that reason, some of the performance measures that we look at have nothing to do with scenarios. If you think about one of them, time to survive, time to survive is not scenario dependent. We look at a specific uh, a node facility in the supply chain or a region in the supply chain, and we ask, if there is a problem here, and I don't know which problem it is, how long can I keep match, matching supply with demand without this facility? That is independent of what was the impact on the specific node. Mm -hmm. When time to survive is very short, we know we may have a problem there, independent of which scenario will materialize. And so mm -hmm. some of our measures, some of our scenarios are very detailed and relate to what uh, we think um, the future may suggest in terms of impact of the business. But some of the KPI are scenario independent and try to give us an insight. Where is the, 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 the hidden risk? Where is the weakest link in the supply chain? Mm -hmm. Do certain things raise red flags? Like, for instance, if a particular company has a single sourcing situation for an essential component, do you immediately flag that as being a, a, a point of, uh, of stress? So this is one uh, insight from the model. But mm -hmm. a lot of time, what a lot of time, what you find from the model, and we have found this uh, in a number of uh, implementation of these types of approach, a company will look at the supply and say, hey, for this component, we have two suppliers or multiple suppliers. What they don't take into account is that these two suppliers may use a single tier two, tier two supplier. And if this single tier two supplier is disrupted, huge impact on the supply chain. We have implemented this, um, for example, in the telecom communication industry. We saw exactly that type of challenge happening. And so just um, focusing on a single source a component is not enough to identify where risk is hidden in your business. And, and Chris, do you find among your client base and among the companies that you have observed around the world, to what degree do they have that level of visibility of those multiple tiers of suppliers that even allow them to assess that? Yeah, it, it's, it is kind of limited, uh, Robert, because we, um, like, like uh, David was saying, you have to go multi-tier into the supply chain to then find those almost uh, single source nodes uh, that, that, that cause a risk. But what we also see is that c clients have typically focused a lot on the strategic items, the big spent items in their raw materials and packaging. But things could be in a very small thing, you know, and also a small thing can actually put your lines down um, and that's where there's been a lot less focus uh, in, in, in even your first tier, uh, first tier supplier. So it's the first tier, also the smaller things that could, could really have a, a massive impact. And then multi-tier down, um, the, the people are truly increasing that visibility, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, we've seen, for example, in life sciences uh, companies that if you look at some of the active ingredients, um, that are out there to uh, feed uh, the pharmaceutical products, 90% of those come, uh, come from one particular region in China, for example. And that's visibility that not everybody had uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. I imagine it's the hope, or is it the hope that this 
particular test could become a kind of global industry standard? Uh, is it that wide ranging? Do you think uh, we're we looking for broad acceptance here? Yeah, that, that is absolutely the ambition. Uh, but what we do realize is that, uh, and we are co-creating this with uh, quite a number of clients, mm -hmm. uh, that the 40 situation scenarios that we talk about will have an industry dependency to them, obviously. Um, and so I would say it has a common ground of a logic that is global and a standard, but will have variations to the actual measurement that is industry segment specific. Well, how interesting, you know, supply chain resilience wasn't a new concept before the pandemic hit, but now that it has, it has uh, perhaps the, the one silver lining, it is leading to a, a level of awareness and education and resiliency based on a test like this that will really help us going forward uh, with global supply chains. I want to thank both of you, Chris Timmermans from Accenture and uh, David Simke Levy of MIT. Thank you so much for explaining to us this new test. Uh, very much appreciate your being with me today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. Bye-bye.